A disappointing end to the tournament for Slovakia, but Slavkovsky keeps his point per game streak alive to end the tournament. But as Canada advances, you can tell Uri Slavkovsky was not very happy about the outcome of this game. And we got some incredible quotes from him and his coach coming up. But we also have to dive into Habs insider Grant McCagg suggesting that the Habs should trade for Patrick Lyonnais. There's a lot of stuff, plus Craig Buttons, new mock draft, all coming up on this episode of Habs Digest, and we're just going to get straight into Slavkovsky, Jesse. It's a disappointing end for Team Slovakia. You know, we're Canadian, but I feel such a connection to Team Slovakia, and it is a bit of a shame to see Slav having to lose like that, but it is what it is. Of course, Team Canada winning 6-3 to versus Team Slovakia, but it wasn't all bad. Like we said, Uri Slavkovsky continues his assist tear. Now, 8 assists in 8 games, tied for the tournament lead. Unfortunately, he won't get a chance to extend that like a couple other people on this list. But some of the quotes about him, some of the stuff he said post-game, he said, hey, it's just not working, just didn't work, whatever. He was not happy. But there was a quote, Slavkovsky when asked when, uh, if it wasn't too much to expect leadership, leadership too much to expect from a 20-year-old guy. No, why? I want to be a leader. I tried to show it in every game. When I sometimes got frustrated, it wasn't because I was angry with someone. I just wanted to win and do everything for it. This is the kind of quote we want, Jesse. Even his coach saying Slav and Nemitz, they're going to be superstars. They're going to be the guy. They can be the guy on the team because that's what they want to be. And despite the loss, you could tell exactly these words, they came true in every single game. And we certainly saw that from them. Yeah, what a great tournament from Slav. You know, getting those eight points in eight games. We don't care if there was all assists. He had an amazing tournament. You know, a great showing from Slovakia as we're seeing that their hockey, you know, their program is going leaps and bounds. Now, for sure, we had an angry Slavzilla there a little bit with the reporters. But you know what? It's all because he cares, right? And when being asked, like, you know, like, he he's a leader, right? He's there. He's there to protect when he has to, right? Um, and that's one of the biggest takeaways for me this tournament is just like the leadership, like seeing him kind of stand up for his players, like defending his goalie, a uh, player in front of the net, like these things matter so much. Like we always knew that he had maybe those capabilities. You know, he's kind of a rookie. He's trying to not be too assertive in his first year, but we're just seeing, you know, this guy's a captain. This guy is somebody that really needs to just assert himself in hockey games and also just for protecting his teammates, right? So an amazing, amazing, um, you know, sort of uh, development here with him. And again, we want to see like him taking ownership. So I love that quote about like, if we're asking who's going to be a superstar, like he's putting his hand up right away. It's like, we need Slav to know that and also to take the initiative. I think the more that he recognizes that, goes into camp for the Montreal Canadiens with this in mind, the better off it'll be for the Habs this year. 100%. And you know he's going to come into camp with that attitude. I mean, even though he didn't get a goal in this tournament, the eight assists in eight games is insane. A point per game at a world championship tournament, that is pretty crazy so it's great to see and hey he could have had a few goals there was a few that like either he got robbed or he hit the post things like that if a little bit better luck and things would have gone his way a little bit better teammates he maybe even would have had four or five six more assists so just an amazing tournament from Slavkovsky thank you all for sticking with us for these uh, Slavkovsky and Slovakia tournament updates um, but that's not the only one Jesse we got a lot to get into in this video so we're gonna go pretty quick through them but we also wanted to mention this Cole Caulfield and Team USA Caulfield played 20 minutes of ice, ice time but they lost to Czechia and Oliver Kapanen in Finland. Kapanen held off the scoreboard again. They both lost. So we won't see USA or Finland in the quarterfinals. The Habs guys are all gone. Aurora was knocked out earlier. Now Slav is out. Caulfield's out. And, well, Gooley's still there. Um, but Kapanen's out as well. So it's only Gooley holding on for, to the Habs right now. And a bit disappointing. Like, I wish I saw a little more from Caulfield. I wish Kapanen maybe kept his streak going in an overtime game against Sweden. He had the opportunities, I guess. But... Uh, sucks to see, but hey, you know what? They all had great tournaments, and we're looking forward to seeing them next year. Oliver Kaplan had an amazing tournament, though. He just took my excitement level from here to, to right mm -hmm. up through the roof right after this tournament. So just amazing to see him really stepping it up. I think he's getting a lot of Habs fans really, really excited to see him very soon here in North America. But nice at least that Cole Caulfield was able to finish off the tournament strong mm -hmm. against Lafayette, getting a four-point game there, two goals, two assists. So I, I would have been much more disappointed if we didn't have at least one showing like that, right? We know we got high expectations from, but nice to at least you know finish off this the tournament somewhat strong but for sure we always have big expectations for a boy yeah it's gonna be exciting though it's gonna be exciting there's so much good to take out of this tournament we still got Gooley going he's a guy who's getting relied upon a lot for team canada and if you look at this clip again they actually had Gooley on the ice against the slap line a lot you can see Gooley skating backwards there trying to hold on to the play but the, yeah anyway great stuff from there but we're gonna move on quickly jesse to this second topic and this is interesting now grant mccagg 
Some people love him, some people hate him. He's an interesting personality, of course, but it's, I always like listening to what he has to say. And a couple weeks ago, he actually wrote an article on his website, recruits.ca, but he was on the Tony Marinaro Sick Podcast to talk about that article where he was talking a bit about Patrick Line. He said, I think you could probably get Line at a decent price right now. I picture a line of Doc Slavkovsky and Line you could put out there, which is pretty insane. But Jesse, he also went on to say this. Bring this up. Oh, is that going to work? There we go. Now we got it. If he does bounce back, talking about line A, 99% of the time, he's going to be better than a kid you pick 25th overall in the draft. Now, his trade proposal, Jesse, was the Winnipeg Jets pick in the draft, which I actually think is 26th. It might be 25th. But I think it's 26th, plus one of uh, Jordan Harris or Jaden Struble. Here's my opinion on this. I'm going to give this straight away. I think if that's the price, you do it. Patrick Line, he hasn't played more than 60 games in four full seasons. But when he's healthy and going, even over the last few years, he's a 35 to 40 goal guy, right? He's making 8.7 million for this year and the next. So you got two years at 8.7 million, but then he's an unrestricted free agent. At that price, I don't mind giving him a shot if he can turn thin things around. It's very hard to get elite level goal scoring. And I think McCag is actually right about that. My only issue is I don't think Columbus accepts that trade package. I think they're going to ask for more despite the issues, the injury issues, the player assistance program, things like that. I, I think if that's if there's an opportunity there, you take a shot if that's the price. Well, what, what are your thoughts? It doesn't look like a good fit culturally at first glance. But if then if there's one coach in the NHL that could really turn Patrick Liney around, just for how personable, positive, you know, the respect that he garners, it's Martin St. Louis. Don't, don't neglect the Martin St. Louis effect that he can have, especially on star players to really help kind of turn around their careers right so i think that that's something to kind of consider you know that martin st louis has a lot of has a voice right with with the montreal canadians and if he feels like this is a player that maybe he can help right i feel like kent hughes is is going to pay attention to that now for sure like we need to start kind of to start competing a little bit more so that means cashing in on our prospects at certain point so i get it being a little bit more of a low risk um, type of move here, but you really have to feel like this team, I don't know, I feel like it's Kent Hughes' baby. And Kent Hughes wants to protect his baby. If he feels like anybody just isn't a good fit culturally whatsoever, he's going to protect it by all means. But I mean, I get what you're saying here, how it's maybe a low risk with a high potential. We just need to make sure it fits the overall plan of this team. Right, like Patrick Line inherently doesn't feel like a low-risk guy, but if it's that price and it is low-risk. risk. But there's also a world where the Habs can give up some more. Like, they were talking about this. A world where Columbus retains some salary on Line A. And in that world, that would be yeah, a huge yeah. ask. You'd have to give up a lot of stuff to get that. But if you can get Line A at, like, even 25% retained so that he's making, what, six million, six and a half million ish that's a lot more palatable for a guy that when healthy is getting 35, 40 goals. And like I've said before, like I said in yesterday's video, finding that elite level goal scoring talent is not easy. You have to also take a risk at some point with the trade. Like it's going to be, it's not impossible, but it's going to be extremely difficult to go through an entire rebuild without ever taking a risk in a trade or a signing for a guy that, you know, ah, oh, like, yeah, he doesn't hit the timeline. Not everything's always going to work out. Oh, beautiful. Oh, like roses. This is amazing, right? Just if you keep conservative. You got to take these swings. You got to take risks. Some could argue they took a swing with Ryan Bakker at the draft. Some could argue they did the same with Slavkovsky. But when you're talking about a, getting an elite level goal scorer, yeah, there are issues. But I think if Kent Hughes and Jeff Gorton do their due diligence and interview him, and again, this is all speculation. There's no, not even any necessary rumors that Columbus is going to move him. But if they can do their due diligence, I, I think, Jesse, if you can get a guy that scores 40 goals a year, why not? I've liked his game for a long time. It's just the one thing for me is like the injuries, right? We know this has been a, an issue for the Montreal Canadiens in the not so distant past. And I know I would be a little bit worrisome about maybe bringing a player on that has a history. We know we just missed all of Kirby Dog all of last year, but the, the upside is there. You know, you have Lane coming in. He's you Because know, you got to feel like if he's playing 50 plus games, you look at his stats, he's going to score 25 goals basically in his sleep, mm -hmm. you know, for a team that needs goal scoring, obviously that skill, he can do it, right? It's just any player we're bringing into our top six, I want to see that hustle on both sides of the ice. We know he's been maybe a little bit of a headache for coaches in the past and some different things. So if you feel you can make it work, I just, for me, I want like a bonafide, like kind of slam dunk 
in our top six is what, really what I'm feeling right now. 100%. And I think he could be that. But hey, there's a bunch of stuff around that. Let us know down below what your thoughts are on potentially getting Patrick Line. So we're going to move into the final topic. We got to talk about Craig Button's wild draft list. There's a lot of mock drafts going around there, Jesse. We're going to keep brief on this one because we don't want to spend too much time. Maybe we'll do a bit of a deeper dive soon. But Craig Button put out a recent mock draft, sort of mock draft. It's sort of a, a, a prediction of who's going to be the best in a few years, which is, I guess, a bit different. But this is one of the most wild lists I've seen. He actually has Zane Parekh going fifth, or well, at least the fifth best ranked prospect for him with Tija Ginla and Consta Hellenius both going before Montreal's pick he doesn't even have Salayev in his top 15 he has Caden Lindstrom at 10 when you look at a list like this Jesse I know Craig Button is the kind of guy who likes to kind of make bold predictions Hellenius at three Tija Ginla at four I know this draft is going to be unpredictable but this really just speaks to it and it makes me wonder like gosh you know we're talking about maybe Montreal going off the board if some people are actually thinking this way I think it might be more likely than we're thinking Absolutely. I like a little bit of this style of, of a draft too, where you're kind of projecting of where you think who the best players will be kind of in five years mm -hmm. from now. But yeah, absolutely. Like constant Hellenius, we're seeing that Craig Buns has a much higher ceiling for him than a lot of other scouts. I definitely agree that Evan Demidov will be the second best player mm -hmm. in this draft at least with the possibility to even maybe overtake a Macklin Celebrini at some point. He's just that talented. He's just that good. And really, when you're seeing this draft ranking here, it almost makes you ask the question, Josh, like, could Tisha Ginla be better than his father, Jerome McGinla? Because if that's the case, as the Montreal Canadiens, you have to you have to think about that. You have to do your homework, your due diligence. Of course, you think they're only even considering that if somehow Demidov and Lindstrom are both taken by the time we draft. And I really hope that that's not the case, right? But there is a potential, right? As as a father, you always want your kids to be to be better than you. And with Tisha Gidla, this could potentially be the case. Yeah, you never know. Like that's the thing. This draft is so unpredictable. Tisha has a, a very interesting skill set now. All things considered, I think it's going to be extremely difficult to top the career of Jerome McGinley. But, I mean, you never really know, right? There's a lot of guys in this draft that I think are going to surprise people. And like Craig Button says, Consta Hellenius, he sees him as an elite center, elite IQ, and a guy who's going to be able to center your top line for years to come. Some people see Consta Hellenius as a guy who's like 3C, maybe two, solid 2C, you know, for, for his career high. There's a lot of speculation here. There's a lot of interesting players. But let us know what your thoughts are of this list down below. Would you consider picking Tisha Ginler or Consta Hellenius at five if Caden Lindstrom was available? We'd love to hear from you. But that'll do it for this episode of Habs Digest. If you enjoyed, leave a like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for all the support you've been showing recently. I'm Josh Goss from my co-host, Jesse Poirier. We'll catch you in the next one.